Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time, we're going to go into one of the most popular strategic games out there. In 1984, Milton Bradley, a game production company, came out with the Game Master series of games. This is their first one, Axes and Allies. Let's get stuck in. So Axis and Allies is a more technically complex game compared to what we usually have played, but it's a fun challenge and it's an excellent strategic game that's entry level and once you get the hang of it, it flows rather quickly. So this simulates not only the economic situation, but the production situation as well. So you're dealing with multiple levels compared to something simpler like Risk, which we've previously covered. So for here, we have the opportunity to play one of five different, what we can call countries into two separate factions. The Axis, which are represented here by Germany and Japan, and the Allies, which are represented collectively by the Soviet Union, the UK, and the United States. Uh, this is the 1941 version of the game, which means that uh, there are multiple different versions out there that have um, the Italians, that even have the Free French, which are currently hiding out in either the UK or parts of North Africa to this point in resistance. We will have different versions of it later on as more is produced in the series. We also have subversions which cover just the Pacific theater, some which just cover the Atlantic theater, some which go as minutia as to one set of battlefield. But for here, we have an overarching picture. So for the economics of this, it's represented by its national production. So it's the kind of the equivalent of all of the factories that are produced. Uh, these are called IPCs, industrial production credits. And along the top wall here, we've got national production. You see that we already have some out here, which represents the relative strength. So for the United States, it starts off with 15 IPCs. There's that there. Japan has nine. The Soviet Union has seven. And both Germany and the UK are going to start equally at 12. So for the course of the game, you've got a fairly simple in the grand scheme of things objective. Control the other capitals of your opponents. So for the Axis powers, the game will end when one of the capitals, which would be London, Moscow, or Washington, D.C. Uh, two of these are captured. This ends the game. So if London and Moscow are captured, this would mean that the Axis win the game. If Tokyo in Japan and Berlin in Germany are captured, that would mean that the Allies win. You can also play this to where when any of the capitals are covered or two of the Allies and only one of the Axis, it entirely depends on which style of game you want to play for this. So. What do we use the credits for? Well, this is where our units come into play. This is a dice-based game. So we'll take the simplistic version here. And thankfully, we have a handy-dandy map for the attackers and defenders. So when two groups are playing against each other, uh, we'll just use uh, the UK and Japan as an example. We've got little pieces here, they will be in competition for somebody to be the attacker and somebody to be the defender. You will have a mix of units. Let's get some just out here as an examples. And this can involve units of land, sea, and air. 
So for the moment, we'll just cover the land aspects. So we'll give Japan one extra here to highlight this. So let's say that Japan is taking its units in Southeast Asia here to attack India. We would actually remove these from the game and place them on this chart here. And it's conveniently labeled. So we've got the infantry here. Uh, and notice the defender has slightly different position based on where they're at. So for the, let's go and look at this as a comparison point. So the infantry down here is sitting at the one. And the infantry on the defender side is sitting at a two. As you can probably guess, this is where our dice rolls come into play. Combat is relatively simple and deals with uh, hits, basically. Each unit, land and air, have one hit. So if any of them are taken out at some point, they're gone. They're removed from the game. So what we'll do is, this is fairly simple, the attacker will roll all of the requisite dice and we'll go from uh, bottom to top. And anything equal to or less counts as a hit. So for the infantry, if you're attacking, you need to roll a one, so a one in six chance. For a tank, you need to roll three, two, or one, so a 50% chance of a hit. Same for the fighter. If you had a bomber, you would also have a four, three, two, or one, increasing the likelihood of a chance. As a defender, your odds are slightly changed. You will get the opportunity to counterattack. And the infantry requires two or one for a hit. The tank has the same odds. The fighter has the same odds as a bomber. So for here, we'll go ahead and roll our die. There's four here. So we'll roll the first infantry one. Six, so nothing. Second infantry. Three, which would have worked for over here, but does not work here. So now the tank. A one. And you can't apply here where that was your infantry roll over here. You're doing it one at a time. So this would be two hits. We'll put it right there. So from here, there will be hits that are assigned. The defender will get to counterattack, so we've got in mind that there are the two hits there. So we'll do the infantry, four, so no hit. The tank, five, no hit. And the fighter, six, no hit. Well, that's a particularly unlucky roll for the defenders. So now there are two hits that have to be applied. And this means removing something from the game. If let's say this had been a one, the attacker would have had a hit. So now what we'll do is we'll have to move things into the casualty zone. You'll remove. So we'll assign the two hits. The infantry can be one of them. So that one's out. Then now you kind of have to choose, let's say the fighter is the one that goes out. And let's treat as though one did hit, that was bad luck. The infantry would be moved here. Now you have the choice. You can press the attack and basically roll again or retreat and everybody goes back to their corner. So from this roll, you're thinking, okay, this is pretty good. Now you're gonna get to roll again. Infantry doesn't hit. The tank doesn't hit. Well, the fighter does. That was a fumble, but we're still going to count it. So that is the one hit. So you think, okay, so the one hit, this tank's gone. You now know you're going to win this battle. But you still get that counterattack. So the one roll, let's see what they can get. A two. So this will be a hit. Now we know the tank is going out. They'll be in the casualty zone. You have to pick something else. So probably just easier to have this other infantry. So now you would remove everything from the board. 
And of course I removed the wrong things. This is the beauty of it. You have to have something to stay behind on occasion, but in this moment we're not going to because you're not obligated to leave a piece there. You can have an area empty, but it does mean you leave it open to a free invasion. It is at this point where at the end of their turn, they've captured India, which is worth this one right here. And they would be able to move up to 10 from their starting nine. That is at its core, back and forth, a combat of this game and your primary driving for proving a win condition. So I'll take a step back. I'll tell you a little bit about the time period and the context behind this map. And then I'll go into setup and the initial turn in the way that it works. One sec. So in order to talk about this game, I have to talk about the history of the time period. This is a simulation war game based in World War II. If you're unfamiliar with the time period, there's numerous resources out there to check in on it, but I wanna give a grand overview of where we're at and the context of why this board looks in the way that it does. There are other versions of Axis and Allies that cover the early war period, the later war period. Uh, the most popular version of this is the 1942 version. What we're showing here is the 1941 version. So this board is roughly a state of the world as it is in December of 1941. The United States was neutral in the war until the Pearl Harbor attacks of December 7th, 1941, that were done by Japan. So this is a state of a couple of things going on. One, there are some of the initial invasions of the surrounding islands. The Philippine Islands will be occupied in real world uh, shortly after this period. Uh, China was invaded in 1937 and North Africa was partially occupied by Italy at this time period. And notice on this game, we do not have Italy represented as an available country. This is for the purposes of balancing of the game. The other big thing going on right now is Operation Barbarossa, which is the invasion of Russia. So that is why modern day Ukraine and West Russia is already occupied by the Germans in this period. So that's a little bit of an overview of the time period of where we're at. And I've got a little bit more to talk about, but that is in just a second. So I took a second to set up the whole board. That way we can go through each of the five countries played here piece by piece, take a look at what units they have, take a look at why things are where they are. Um, one of the key things about a game is balance and making sure that everyone has a fair opportunity to play in a way that'll let them win, but also try and be accurate because this is supposed to be a somewhat historically accurate game in the grand scheme of things. So let's go over the situation. I'm going to start in the order in which it'll be played. So it will be Soviet Union, Germany, the UK, Japan, and then the US will play last. And this will go in the same order, no matter what, there won't be skipping of turns at any point. Uh, but let's take a look at the Soviet Union first. So they are doing a lot of defending uh, in the historical borders of the Soviet Union. Um, they would have been occupying most of what is labeled as West Russia here, uh, the state of Ukraine as it is here. So these are obviously not modern day borders. These are the Soviet era borders. This is circa December 1941. And right now there is a defense of what is central Russia. And they have different types of units. And this is a good opportunity to talk about what the units are and how they differ. In the grand scheme of things, you're looking for the best dice rolls possible. If you notice from our example with the infantry on the attack, you needed a one 
out of six. Whereas with a tank, you needed a three or less. The increased cost of the unit is roughly proportional to the likelihood that your unit is more likely to succeed and hit. Uh, the major difference is survival. Almost everything is one hit. Tank and infantry will still be affected by the unit itself. Um, and there's no artillery pieces. In the 1942 game, there are artillery pieces that change the way in which infantry units work. This is a very simplified version, hence why if you're interested in this game, this is probably one of the easiest setups you've got. So Russia has a boatload of infantry units for defense. And you notice these little tokens here on the bottom. On the back of the rule book, it has Russia's having three infantry, one tank, and one fighter. And there's not a crazy lot of units here. So we have these little tokens that are helpful with this gray one representing one, this green one representing three, and the red one representing five. So when you start getting a stack of units together, you can replace to try and simplify your units. If you run out of them because you've just gotten to a awkward situation with how you've purchased the units, which we'll get to in a second, you are going to then deal with writing it down and everyone understands what decisions were made. So for the Soviet Union, one of the things they're looking at is they're absolutely going to be fully attacked by Germany here in their turn, which is up next. So they've got a couple decisions to make to how are they going to survive this attack. Now, for the other side of the continent for them, they're on Siberia, there isn't as much of a risk, and typically the goals are elsewhere, but it is eligible to be technically attacked. For Germany, it is trying to expand, uh, stretch out their elbows as quickly as possible, because if you notice that right now Russia is sitting only at seven of the national production, but they're up against two opponents that are going to be on the Atlantic that have the same number and also more. So as a net, you're going to run out of time fairly quickly because you notice that Japan, who is your ally, uh, has nine. You're already from behind. So you have to try and capture what you can as fast as you can. So notice that uh, Anglo-Egypt Sudan is all one collective areas here, and that's worth one point. So there's an opportunity. Uh, notice these uh, central nations right here that are neutral. You cannot move into these neutral territories. They're, it's completely ineligible. Sorry, you can't. So for Germany, they're going to want to see if the UK is able to be invaded. Uh, if they can take that, that would be capturing one of the capitals, which is one of the end goals of this game, and also is worth three units on its own. Capturing a capital is the object of the game in order to win. But they're probably going to be focusing on trying to take out Russia, because they've only got seven here, but they've got a lot of units to start. And if you've noticed, the defender has a slight advantage in whatever attacks being made. So for the Germans here, they are able to start moving units into North Africa eventually, but notice that Eastern Europe here has four infantry and two tanks. You're able to start moving these in the non-combat move. But using this West Russia and the Ukraine units right here will be massively important to determine the course of this game. For the UK, they've got their lonely island up here, but they've also got the rest of their colonial acquisitions to defend from two different spaces. One in North Eastern Africa and one in the Australian continents and the India holdings. So they're going to have to use those resources. They have more, but they have to spread it out. So they will be spread thin over the course of the game. They'll want to keep India for sure. 
Australia is technically safe for the moment. So a little bit more about the map and where it's at right now. Decolonialization has not happened yet. That doesn't happen until the 1950s in our timeline. So for here, uh, the British Empire still controls a wide swath of the uh, African continent, parts of the Middle East, and India. India does not become a free state until 1947 when it becomes India and Pakistan. Now, you see these neutral powers here that aren't directly involved. Some of these countries were also neutral, but for the purposes of connecting everything together for this game, they gave it to the UK as just a balancing method, similar to how Italy is occupied by Germany. Uh, it will be occupied later in real life, but that doesn't happen until 1943. Also down here, Southeast Asia is occupied by Japan during the war. So this is fairly accurate to how the time period's going. Notice these little, uh, what looks to be like a little factory here. These are essentially where the units themselves can spawn. And let's see, you can't spawn them in uh, Anglo-Egypt, Sudan, but you can spawn them in India. This means that you'll be able to use this Middle East area as long as you control it to bring things over here because there is a movement speed for all of the units. And I'll bring your attention right down here. So infantry can move one space per turn. Tanks can move two. So they could go from Italian East Africa to North Africa in one turn, as long as it's a friendly unit. Fighter can move a certain number of spaces in the air, but they do have to land somewhere friendly. So see this German fighter that's right here. They can move one, two, and let's say they were attacking Russia here. They could move three, but then they'll have to move back to West Russia to land, and they could be at risk of being hit if there's a counterattack. Bombers can move six. Those are some important units that you don't want to bring out unless you have to because I'll bring you over to the attacker bit again. The bombers over here at four or less and they cost 12 IPCs just to make a single one. So they can be very important to have. A large majority of what you're going to be purchasing are these land units and trying to keep those alive. Uh, air and then eventually seas are a luxury. And I will talk briefly about the sea zones here. Notice that Russia's up here in the corner. They don't have as much of a need for a navy right now, but they can later expand into doing so. Germany is trying to make sure that units can't be moved over here as much as possible. Uh, notice that the UK has some aircraft carriers that they can make use of, and the fighters can land and take off from those aircraft carriers. So they're essentially mobile zones of landing and they can be used to great effect. Uh, and I'll go ahead and move on to Japan over here, which is trying to conquer the rest of the Chinese space and then eventually move into uh, India and Australia. Uh, but they've also got competition from the US, which I'll get to in a moment. So they're trying to stretch their elbows as quickly as possible and for them, uh, getting control of India, getting control of Australia will be immensely helpful because if you can take both of those, then the places where you can spawn a unit becomes pretty close to impossible, except for over there. Um, let's see what else is going on here. So they can mostly stay along this coastline here. Everything can stay as compact as possible as long as your units are surviving. So now the US. The US has the fewest number of units in terms of power projection here. There's one on Hawaii. There's one on the Philippines here. Everything is stuck here, except for the fact that there are transports as a part of this game. So I'll talk about the C units really quick. Uh, transports can move units to and fro. Uh, the aircraft carriers, like I mentioned, can hold the fighters. 
The battleships are a special unit as far as sea units goes in that they can take two hits. So if there is a naval combat and you get one of those hits from the dice roll, the battleship, if it is chosen as one of your hits, you will just simply lay it, and I'll use the Japan one here, you will lay it on its side. Assuming it survives the combat, you'll actually get to bring it back upright. So it can be a very powerful unit to soak up some of the damage in a sea battle. But things can escalate rather quickly for this game, especially when it comes to the sea combats. So everything is fairly balanced where there are competing goals and trying to make sure that people are willing to capture whatever territory they're wanting to go for. Uh, Japan will probably be going for nothing else, the Eastern United States, if they can win over here. And I will mention that these are connected, so you can move across the board. So Western and Eastern United States are connected. Western and Eastern Canada are connected. Uh, this is 21 over here in the bottom corner. That's connected to 35. It's not connected to 36. Uh, 36 is connected to 20. 41 is connected to 19. Because I think I need to talk about the canals real quick. There's the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, which do exist during this time period. As long as you're controlling it, you can freely pass through it without it counting as movement. So it's not like a separate state. It only counts as one. So that's an overview of the map. Take another step back, tell you a little bit more about this time period, and then I'm going to go through the first turn. So on the map, one more place to talk about, China. Uh, Mongolia is neutral for this, and uh, the Himalayas and Afghanistan are also neutral space. But uh, for the purposes of this game, we need to talk about the Flying Tigers. During the, what we now call the Second Sino-Japanese War, which is a part of overall World War II, uh, the United States was neutral for a large part of the war. However, due to various policies that were implemented, they were able to support tacitly and off the record, not violating any neutrality laws, both China and also the UK and France at certain points. Uh, also later on, they will be used to help the Soviet Union as the initial invasion continues. But this is not as jarring as it normally it would be because the United States did support Chinese forces during this war period, but most notably the Flying Tigers, which was an air unit that operated entirely out of China for the course of most of the war. So recognizing that role that was implied and only having five players in this game, they had to make some balancing decisions, which meant China is technically run by the United States player. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. So that was the first, basically, turn of what can be a longer game. Next time, I'm going to go into some of the scenarios and strategies that you'll have to do in order to become even better at this game. I'll see you next time.